if you can see the Regent Entertainment logo unspooling before your very eyes right now. Congratulations, you are watching Ring of Darkness, and we are perfectly in sync with you. My name is Matty Budrevich, and joining me as always is Mr Dave Wayne. Hello. And we are here today to launch the first in what we hope is going to become a kind of regular thing here at theschlockpit.com, and that is commentaries that we are recording about films we love for our own perverse pleasure and amusement. Yes, and what better way to begin than with Ring of Darkness, a David Dakota film. Mm. You know, we've been friends for eight years. We bonded over people like G.R. Bookwalter, Charles Band, and David Dakota. So to sit here together for an hour and a half and watch a Dakota movie is really very, very cool. And what a perfect introduction for people that might not be au fait with mm. the iconic Canadian auteur. Yeah, because the good thing about Ring of Darkness mm. is that is this is very much a gateway film. As gateway. A, as a gateway, gateway film as a David Dakota experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is full of all the wonderful trademarks mm -hmm. of his work. So, you know, the biggest, of course, is the hunks in tight white underwear, which, for the record, we are sat wearing right now in, in honour of the maestro. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's got that, it's got the teasing homoerotica, it's got the mischievous sense of fun about it, but it isn't too intrusive or as impenetrable as something like the 1313 series, mm -hmm. which... You know, in a roundabout way, I guess I'm trying to say is for all the violently hetero people who might be listening to this and recoiling in horror, you know, this isn't so gay as that it'll make you start questioning yourself. Don't worry, straight people. You'll be fine. You, you, your sexuality <laughs> is safe with us. But, no, it's just a very, very good entry point. Um, I think a large part of that is the fact that it is, it is probably one of his most cohesive movies mm. it is very it is plot focused there is yeah. a story to it whereas as we'll probably go on to discuss later david dakota movies completely abandoned any pretense at you know narrative storytelling mm. mm. altogether and became increasingly more about the images yeah. and things yeah. like that so yeah this is a good off point for us to go with and that's a great shot isn't mm -hmm. it i mean you know you're better at describing things like that than me but that shows perfectly kind of the artistry of Dakota mm, and what he's capable of, completely. helped immeasurably by the fact that he's shooting on 35 mil. Mm. And, you know, he has a great eye for, for, for cinema. Mm. David Dakota is, it infuriates me no end mm. that too often do, do the words hack or schlockmeister or things like that get leveled his way when really, again, look at that. Mm. Marvellous, marvellous stuff. Where he he is a tremendous stylist. Mm. David Dakota movies might run the gamut in quality from sheer excellence to some, and based purely on the volume of his work, you know, you, you can't be brilliant without making the occasional doo-doo. Mm. You know? So he is a stylist, and he knows his onions when it comes to making atmospheric horror movies. Mm. I mean... There are a lot of lazy film critics out there who sort of tar Dakota films with the same brush, mm. give them short shrift. They probably look at your writing on Dakota as some kind of crazy parody mm. because th th they don't believe that someone can appreciate what Dakota does to such no. a high degree. And you're completely serious, aren't you? You De are completely deadly serious. serious. I think the, the, man's a, the man's a bloody visionary. Mm, He's an mm. artist. And the fact is that he has managed to forge a, what, 86 is when he entered mainstream mm -hmm. movie making, yeah. or how, how, you know, whether you call Dream Maniac a mainstream mm -hmm. film or not. Is it? But, you know, he has forged a career since 1986, mm -hmm. and you don't have that lo much longevity in movie making without being good at what you do yeah. and without staying abreast of trends and without finding your own niche mm -hmm. 
broad smile for this montage of clips. Ah, I love these music videos. <laughs> to be honest, last night I, I couldn't sleep because this song was, was rattling around my head. It is an earworm. It is an earworm. It is an earworm. Um, we just waved goodbye to someone, didn't we? We waved goodbye to Gordo, mm. played by Greg Sipes there, he's leading the band. Um, but he's just been off to buy his fellow band members. Mm -hmm. Why? Because, David, they are a zombie boy band. Uh -huh. And he made the mistake of not wanting to join their undead throng. <laughs> uh, so he had to be killed. Mm -hmm. Where do you, do you think this was pitched at? Because obviously American Idol mm. was only just beginning, well, it was a couple of years old, it first aired on Fox in June 2002. Mm -hmm. Um... But I think during this period with the NSYNC Backstreet Boys kind of thing, there was a huge kind of trend for mm. boy bands, wasn't there? And there weren't really many movies catering to that. No. Um, one thing that Dakota has said in interviews is that the, this, the script for Ring of Darkness, it's, mm. uh, it began life initially as, a, as an idea for a potential sequel to David Dakota's iconic uh, homoerotic vampire movie The Brotherhood mm. or if uh, if you listen to this over in the UK as we got it I've been watching yeah. um, so this originally was going to be The Brotherhood 4 mm -hmm. uh, and it was written as Boys to Death mm -hmm. you know as in Boys to Men <laughs> so a little, little joke there uh, and Dakota has said that at the time it was written, boy bands were very, very popular. Yeah. You know, with Backstreet Boys, with NSYNC. But by the time the film actually got made, that trend was sort of petering out a little bit. Right. And as the demise of the boy band factors into the plot somewhat, mm. as we'll see later on when it's revealed that this band has been around for many years in various yeah. forms, yeah. you know, he felt that it had a certain degree of okay, this is going to ride the zeitgeist now with boy bands petering out, mm -hmm. with pop idol and stuff taking over instead and making the manufactured element even more obvious. Mm. You know, not even hiding how manufactured artists and bands and stuff were. Yeah. But, you know, it, it was a relevant and sort of slyly satirical story. Mm -hmm. When did you discover this film? Because I was late mm. watching this for the very first time. Okay. Because... To me, like Dakota's career is kind of split into segments. Yeah, you got without that, doubt. Yeah. You got the early segment, which takes you up to about just pre full moon, maybe ninety eighth time. I know he did some bits for full moon, mm. but then you got ninety eight to two thousand and four, which for British people, like for us here, that was like incredible exposure where we got everything. Mm. But I think. Ring of Darkness was pretty much the last film that we got for a good long while, wasn't it? Mm. Um, we didn't get the Sisterhood. You nope. know, didn't get we Witches didn't get of the Caribbean, anything Beastly like Boys. that. Beastly Boys. Nope. Um, so, you know, th 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 this was pretty much the, the, the feast before the famine, mm. Mm. Um, which was a shame. I I can remember. I, I feel like I'm just going to start sounding like one of the <laughs> me, one of the video nasty type fetishists. But this <laughs> film, uh, this was my first introduction right. to the mm. work of David Dakota. It wasn't the first film of his that I watched, but it was the first time I became aware of who David Dakota mm. was. And I believe it was in a review in Kim Newman's Video Dungeon in right. an old 2004 issue of Empire mm. whereby it was just like a one sentence kind of thing like yeah. another homoerotic teen shocker from the specialist David Dakota right. and I remember it really intrigued me I remember it being an ubiquitous title mm. in Blockbuster uh, and Choices Video and places like that for, for reasons we'll probably get into later on mm -hmm. Um before we do that, though, I do think that we need to point out there is the great hey. Adrian Barbo. Mm -hmm. uh, this part of the band's manager, Alex, was originally earmarked for Antonio Sabato Jr. Right. Uh, they couldn't get Antonio Sabato Jr., so uh, Dakota's second choice was Dolph Lundgren. You know, I can see, yeah, the, I can see where you're going <laughs> there. Uh, but... Somewhere along the line, the idea came about to turn Alex into a female character. Mm. Uh, so, Barbo was cast. And interestingly, Dakota had worked with Adrian Barbo years before when he was a mm. production assistant on Escape from New York. 
Yeah. You know, it's crazy. But I think it's a perfect match, to be honest. I think the female character works. Mm. I think Adrienne in her outfits, giving those long, cold stares as she watches the uh, rehearsals, I think that worked perfectly. Mm. I couldn't see anyone else in that role, especially not Dolph Lundgren. I don't think it would have, <laughs> you know. It would, have, it would have certainly increased the more flagrant homoerotica. This poor guy here, who's making a really, really bad uh, audition, uh, it's Josh Hammond, isn't it? Mm-hmm. From the uh, the very first Brotherhood film. And it's a really bad audition. Obviously with, with a great throng of uh, watching people. <laughs> Do you know when this film was shot? Um, Do you want to hazard a guess? I'm going to hazard a guess at 2003 sometime. Mm-hmm. You're not, you are not, not far wrong. If you look in the background of this scene, you can see... Uh, a, a bunch of paraphernalia for the movie SWAT mm. with Colin Farrell. Uh, so I'm guessing that Ring of Darkness was shot in summer 2003 time, late right. summer, as mm-hmm. that film came out July time. Uh, Ring of Darkness was filmed in eight days, which is absolutely staggering. <laughs> uh, and Dakota shot an average of around 12 to 15 pages of script a day. Um, and just to put that in context, most Hollywood slash studio movies, they tend to shoot one to five pages a day, depending mm. on what's meant to be happening on screen. Um, another point of interest with Ring of Darkness's production mm. is that it was made for a surprisingly high budget of $750,000. Right. Uh, and, uh, well, that's what the Dakota said in Fangoria anyway. Mm. And certainly to me, that's in the upper reaches of the Dakota budgets. Um, it's not quite as big as Skeletons mm-hmm. and Absolution the Journey, which were a smidge over 2 million and 1.7 million, respectively. Uh, but if you compare Ring of Darkness to the to the stuff that Dakota made for Full Moon in the late 90s, which were all like $200,000 or less, three quarters of a million, that's a big chunk of change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, what, what are they making those 13, 13 movies for? Oh. A, l- a fraction of that, <laughs> a fraction, and often, and often with schedules anything from three days yeah. or less. Wasn't you know. wasn't two Voodoo Academy mm. one day? It was yeah, I think that was one sixteen hour day. Jesus, crazy. Um, so the band audition, uh, where we're going to find out um, who eventually goes to, well, get to the final three to be mm. the band's new lead singer. This young man. Is um, this is Eric Dearborn as Max? Max. Yeah, um, he, former teen <clears throat> model, and you, you can tell. Um, soap actor to begin with, all my children. Now he's a professional photographer, and you really should head over to his Instagram page. He's really got a great eye. Some great photographs over there. I tell you what, I love about this sequence is that uh, they're all. They're all lip syncing and dancing <laughs> to the same song. Um, I'm not. I mean, I, I love it. Right? You know, I, I, it's very joyously silly, and yeah. like, I, I like to think that it's some kind of dig at how manufactured this kind mm-hmm. of pop mm-hmm. music is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as in, it do, you know, it doesn't even matter that all the auditionees are doing is dancing and miming. <laughs> at their audience, they're just going to lap that shit up regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I do think we need to be honest. And it's totally a budget and time thing because there's a line of dialogue where one of the characters uh, later, uh, Jeremy Jackson's character, mm-hmm. Xavier, the, the band's leader, he says it's it's about the sound of the audition. So I think we <laughs> I, I think it was just the line just before Max came on. Actually. Right, right, right. So clearly they're all meant to be singing. Mm-hmm. And there's a line later on where Alex remarks of uh, of another character, of the Sean character, that. Uh, he's got the best singing voice I've heard, and <laughs> you know. But whatever, it's just it's part of Ring of Darkness's charm yeah, for me, yeah. and I and I'm going to take it as as Dakota's cheeky digging the ribs to the manufactured nature of pop yeah, music. No doubt. Um, you mentioned some of the dialogue there. The dialogue for this film was, of course, written by um, an interesting twosome of mm. uh, Matt Walsh, mm-hmm. who we love dearly. I mean, how many times has he worked with Dakota? Probably. 
Ugh, I, do, I wouldn't even have a figure Whoa. for that. I mean, officially, there's, officially. there's a difference between yeah, how yeah. many of his scripts actually have been uh, filmed by mm, Dakota mm. and how many other things he's come up with or how many have, have, have transformed into something else. Prolific. I mean, mm. we go way back when to his Tempe days where mm-hmm. he made some great films for Joe Buckwell too. Um, before, of course, I think he is a musician by trade, is he? Yeah, yeah. Cause, uh, and if memory serves, he did the music on... Um, he played a lead role in Midnight Two. Is it Midnight oh, Two? Yeah. Sex, Death, and Video to mm-hmm. the uh, John Russo sequel to his Satanic Slasher. Yeah, um, it's sort of like a Henry portrait of a serial killer kind of spin of a whole Midnight Satanic mm-hmm. thing. Um, but he had a leading role in that, and I believe he composed the music right. to it as well. And so, yeah, I think he is a musician by trade, Matt Walsh. Yeah, Matt Walsh co-wrote the script with Michael Gingold, who you'll know as being the former um, Fangoria bod. Who had written another film with Dakota, hadn't he? Mm-hmm, yeah, he'd written Leeches right before this. Which we loved dearly. Yes. And you can listen to our podcast on, on Leeches as well, which we recorded uh, a few months back for Natural Selection. Mm. Um, they do all right. You know, it's not a bad script. Mm. You know, I, I, as you said at the start, there's more to it than a lot of later Dakota films. Yeah. Plus, it does have that really intriguing twist. Uh about this incarnation, this this reincarnation mm. of the boy band, which I think is absolutely genius. Um, the film, well, the script, sorry, it did. I, I think we need to say that it began life as something called Boys to Death, mm, mm. Uh, and before that, it, it it was planned to be a sequel to the Brotherhood. Yeah, it was going to be Brotherhood Four. Obviously, that changed a little bit down the line, and well, I think in order to explore that aspect of it, we need to talk a little bit about Regent Entertainment. Okie dokie. Okay. Uh, Regent Entertainment, uh, owned by, well, were owned by Paul Collickman and Stephen P. Jarkow. Mm. Uh, both of them, they'd produced Bill Condon's uh, James Whale biopic, Gods and Monsters, which had bagged an Oscar uh, for like Best Adapted Screenplay, and I, I think it'd been nominated uh, for two more. I think Ian McKellen got a, a Best Actor nod, and Lynn Redgrave got a Best Supporting Actress nod. Didn't, didn't Sam Irvin... Pers- yeah, yeah Sorry. absolutely. Jumping ahead of you. So, uh, Dakota, he hooked up with... Uh, Collickman and Jarkow mm. uh, I presume via Sam Irvin who was a co-producer on Gods and Monsters yeah. and who was a friend of Dakota because mm-hmm. of their full moon connection because Irvin had of course directed Oblivion 1 and 2 mm-hmm. over in Romania which in another twist of fate to, which to, <laughs> to almost underline how incestuous and how interconnected the B-movie world is Dakota actually shot Petticoat Planet on the same sets mm-hmm as uh, Oblivion 1 and 2. Yeah. So, you know, Irving made his sci-fi action western, Dakota made his sexy all-girl western. Mm. Uh, anyway, so one of the first films that Dakota had pitched to Regent, uh, it was a modern spin on Dangerous Liaisons. Uh, basically, his it was going to be his answer to Cruel Intentions, and it was called The Devil is a Woman, which finally came to be in 2008 as Playing With Fire. Uh, and I do feel that you know we that movie is pretty. If you can find it, please watch it because it is, you know, as Dakota himself describes it, irresistibly. It's it's a pansexual film noir. If mm. that doesn't pique your interest, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but anyway, so the the devil is a woman. That didn't happen right away. Like I said, that took till two thousand and eight for that to be made, mm-hmm. and this is still ninety eight, ninety nine time. Uh, but Regent. Um, they did start churning out and acquiring a couple of director video genre movies um, Uwe Boll's uh, Sanctimony mm-hmm. John Carl Beekler's Deep Freeze and they actually picked up and I think they may have even part financed uh, Brotherhood 2 Young Warlocks right, right. Uh, for Dakota and so then they signed Dakota to direct Wolves of Wall Street mm. uh, and The Brotherhood 3 uh, Young Demons, and that in turn led to this, to Ring of Darkness, which had been developed as a Brotherhood concept and now was going to become its own movie. Mm-hmm. We were just introduced to um, our lead actor, by the way, the, uh, Xavier, 
Well, Xavier, I think they pronounce it. Xavier. Xavier. Um, and also uh, the guy who, who eventually goes on to be the, the lead in the band, um, Sean, uh, played mm -hmm. by Stephen Martinez. I mean, he was really sweating in that audition. So as you say, I think it must have been the height of summer that this was shot because he was dripping in sweat. Mm -hmm. I love the mansion in this movie. Mm. I love the way it's shot at night. I think it's gorgeous. I mean, obviously, Dakota's got a whole history with, with like, nice, long, fine looking mansions, but I think this one in particular just looks absolutely mm. bee's knees. Look at my wardrobe there from 2004. <laughs> So all this music video stuff here, this was all shot um, almost on the fly. They had planned to make a music video to go into the movie, mm. but Dakota said that they'd often be at a location and they'd spot mm. something else mm. and they'd quickly grab another shot or something oh, right, to throw okay. in there just to mix it up a bit. Um, getting out this car right now, we have Ryan Starr as Sean's girlfriend, Stacy. Uh, and she, of course, she came seventh on the first mm. series of American Idol in 2002. And there is Stephen Martinez as the film's quote-unquote hero, Sean. Although uh, maybe one criticism of the film is that he, he's kind of an arsehole. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I never want him on screen as a character mm. that, you know, you're meant to be rooting for this guy. But mm. on screen, I never, I never get it. I never get any inkling of support for him. Um, I mean, ironically, he had starred in another boy band film back in 1999 called Boy Wonders with a Z, <laughs> um, which was ah, a, the 90s. which was an indie drama about the pitfalls of the music business. Mm. So he had previous in regard to boy band movies, uh, and he also began life um, with Full Moon. He was in both Kra, the sea monster, and also Planet Patrol, which followed mm. a year later. Um, in real life, though, he's a bit of a he's a bit of a character, yeah, isn't um, he? Really? I it, mean, if, if if you have some spare time on on Google, I'd urge you to dig out a copy of the Riverfront Times from February the twenty eighth, two thousand eighteen. It's a wonderful ar article by uh, Robert um, Langelier uh, called "The Pool Repairman and the Hollywood Hustle." which uh, tells a quite staggering story about the personal life, the alleged personal life of Stephen Martinez, uh, which goes on to allege again, the fact that post movie career, he made a habit of befriending a bevy of beautiful women and then extorting them for huge amounts of money. And doing a runner each time it's it's a gripping long read but i urge you to seek it out it, it's a fascinating story of clearly a a, a troubled character with a, a number of issues mm, he'd also um in that same art is that the one where he'd shafted over that uh, guy who wrote a novel about his his dead son yeah it's uh mm. i could say you know these are all allegations but it's it's fairly there is definitely damning. A, yeah, yeah. A pattern of behaviour to the guy. Yeah. Um, but on a on a lighter note, prior to this, Martinez had uh, just completed a three year stint on General Hospital, the long running US mm. store. Prior to this, where uh, he he worked under the stage name of Colton Scott. So this was the the first project that he appeared in under his own name. Right. Um, it's interesting, though, that you're looking there at uh, Jeremy Jackson as Xavier, uh, who's best known for playing Dave, David Hasselhoff's son in Baywatch. Um, Jackson appeared in a whopping 159 episodes of the show, which it is second only to Hasselhoff, who appeared in 220 episodes. And it's kind of fitting that he, too, in real life, is <laughs> uh, a bit of a train wreck. Mm. Um I guess he's the archetypal former child star. Yeah. Drink, drugs. Um, was Brit. You might remember him being on Celebrity Big Brother a couple of years yeah, ago, yeah. and uh, he was kicked out the house after after getting 
quite pissed <laughs> and uh, pulling another contestant's boob out of a top. Mm. Um, yeah, it sounds he's a bit of a grim individual, in all honesty. Um, got a, a hell of a criminal record. He stabbed a woman in 2015 after she tried to stop him stealing her boyfriend's car. And that was after he'd stabbed someone else a few months before that he was also apparently trying to rob. Um, there's, a, again, uncomfortable allegations of him uh, being a bit of a spousal abuser um, to the extent where apparently he tried to strangle his wife at the time. So, um, troubled character, he's probably putting it mildly. The, guy, uh, the guy's got some real deep-rooted issues and it's just strange how this film is buoyed by two extremely talented actors whose personal lives are... Well, reprehensible. Well, it went dark very quickly, didn't very it? Very dark. <laughs> very dark. Well, oh. now it's out the way. We can focus it's out the way. on the dance numbers. Happy times. And the happiest stuff. <laughs> and the sheer artistry of Ring of Darkness. But you you got to talk about you got to take the rough from the smoothest. And mm. sadly, B-movies, they they have colourful histories. Mm, they, mm. And they do... Certain colourful people do get attracted to them. Yeah, so, yeah. You've got to take the rough of a smooth in this game. Just to run through the rest of the cast, though, the guy in the headband is the choreographer, who is Jake, played by Matt T. Baker. Uh, he was introduced to David Dakota by Greg Carney, also an actor who played Wiper in Speed Demon. Uh, and it's, uh, Wiper, the guy who played Wiper, actually went on to produce Material Girls a few years later. Um, but yeah, short career for, for Matt Baker. I think he's teaching gym classes maybe in all right okay th- 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 place i could trace him to um but yeah rounding up the band you also got bj <coughs> uh, played by colin bain uh great name uh that's, who, that's a classic dakota joke but i'll let you i'll let you tell us a little bit about him and i'll tell you the, the dakota jokes well bj funnily enough uh has is another character with a history of a boy band all right, uh, so, okay. Yeah. I did not know this. Yes. He was in a short. Um, <laughs> this is this is quite weird to me. He was, he was in a short called Crush in 2000. Right, okay. Um, which went on a compilation called Boys to Men. Okay. Which was a compilation of short gay films, or gay short films, whichever way you want to spin that. But yeah, he played a boy band model. Oh, All right, film, okay, that's which, cool. Which was really weird. That's cool. Uh, with the the BJ thing, one of the great trademarks of David Dakota is there is a wonderful, naughty sense of humour mm. to his work. I don't want to say like camp, but it's sort of it's maybe like end of the pier kind of yeah. innuendo and double entendre. Um, you know, you see it as far back as something like Doctor Alien, where mm, mm. the guy has pretty much. He has this little alien growth popping out the top of his head that gets aroused when he sees beautiful women. Mm, and mm. which, of course, you know, you don't have to be a biologist to know that clearly it's a it's meant to be an erect penis. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, we've got the killer eye, <laughs> which... Uh, I only realised this when you wrote that essay. That. <laughs> but, you know, if I say the words, a one-eyed monster, a giant <laughs> one-eyed monster, and the entire film of the killer eye is about a sexually frustrated housewife, well, rich housewife, <laughs> who's pissed off that her gorgeous, hunky doctor husband is spending all his time in the basement with undressed hot undressed men and a big one-eyed monster. <laughs> so you you take from that whatever. Uh, then of course you've got leeches. Pseudon- written... Pseudonym as well for. Tomorrow. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. And the killer I was directed under the pseudonym Richard Chasen. I'll let you guys figure that one out. Uh, but yeah, then of course you got leeches, leeches. which yeah. Gingold wrote, uh, as we mentioned, and that basically is one giant cock joke mm. of a film. I mm. think even Gingold himself had said that in his original draft of Leeches, the film was a little bit more on the nose with its innuendos. Mm. But even still, I mean, these throbbing, pulsating masses, you know, they are, they're just big fat dicks aren't they let's be honest <laughs> but Dakota's work does have a lot of these sort of John Watersy type double entendres 
And now you should say John Waters, we have just seen on screen Mink Stoll, who plays uh, Fletcher. Uh, she, of course, had worked with John Waters since the age of 19, beginning with uh, The Wizard of Oz. In 1966, and of course, she did feature in a Dakota movie, didn't mm-hmm. she? Yeah, yeah, one of his most important mm-hmm. movies as well. Um, Leather Jacket Love Story, his little black and white uh, gay romantic comedy from 1997. Mm. Uh, I think that was probably as good a time to any actor to to mention. I think what you brought up earlier about the, the era of David Dakota, oh, mm. where you know, if you look at his CV, is is monumental. There is nothing, with the possible exception of Roger Corman, Jim Wynorski, and Fred Olin Ray, and, and, and obviously and Charles Banser. These guys, their CVs are incredible, and Dakota's is probably the most interesting and most auteur driven out yeah. of all of them. Uh, what fascinates me about them, about it, is that you, you can split it into very distinctive eras. You know, you've got his initial uh, hardcore mm-hmm. phase when he st- when he was uh, learning the trade in, in uh, the hardcore porn industry yeah. in the 80s then of course between 86 and 97 you had him working as a gun for hire yeah. mostly with Charles Band uh, in that time frame of course he set up Full Moon's uh, erotic subdivision Torchlight mm-hmm. uh, and then a few other Places as well, he was doing for higher work for his own cinema home video, uh, hit, hit entertainment where he made Pray of the, Jag, uh, Pray of the Jaguar, and then 1997 time that's where the Dakota that we know today started forming, you know. Yeah, now it had always been there, and I'm a very strong I, I, I argue this all the time that homoerotica has, has gone hand in hand with David Dakota's. You know, quote unquote legitimate mm, work, mm. i.e., his non pornographic stuff. Since Dream Maniac, that film's an inc- that's his his debut feature proper. Okay, that's his first legitimate movie. Although, if you've seen Dream Maniac, I'm not sure if you you know you can really call it legitimate. It's a micro budget slasher movie, but it is great. I love it. But it's a very very homoerotic film. Mm. So it's it had always been there, but it wasn't until 1997 time when he made Skeletons. Uh, for Hit Entertainment, who he'd previously made Prey of the Jaguar for. Mm. Uh, Absolution the Journey uh, for EGM, which yeah. was John Ayres' company, and Leather Jacket Love Story. Mm. Those three films in 1997, they should be termed, as, what I like to term anyway, as his coming out trilogy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that was the first time that homosexuality and, and gayness and queerness had become part an, an explicit part of his filmmaking mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then after that that's when we had a whole what 97 to 99 a full moon we had all his increasingly homoerotic horror movies that he'd make there where you'd have you know you'd have shrieker that start teasing a bit of gay baiting imagery talisman that mm-hmm. really went to town with the gay baiting imagery curse of the puppet master which became very very homoerotic mm. and then if that ultimately leads to voodoo academy in 2000 and then after that boom yeah. all better that is the dakota that we know and love today mm. the homoerotic horror auteur yeah i think that's my favorite period yeah, I don't without know if question. That equals it for you. Yeah, um, but that period certainly for me and the, the time. It, 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 I mean, I'm biased because it, it coincided with with me growing up at that time and getting into films. Mm. So it was the first. They were the first films that I. I don't want to sound like a video store bore, <laughs> but they were the first films I rented, mm. and they really caught my royal eye you know yeah I know what you mean because they, they were just and not so prolific um, mm. but they were so Chris I just before we crack on with more of Dakota's CV I just want to mention Josh isn't it um, Jonah played by Jeff Peterson mm-hmm. now we've seen him before obviously because he's in Legend of the Mummy 2 mm-hmm. and he's in Prison of the Dead mm-hmm. but that's a rarity Jeff, uh, sorry, Jonah's playing the investigative reporter who's you know got his way into the band through a back door, so to speak. Um, but you know, Jeff Peterson was in three Dakota films. Mm. That doesn't happen. No, no. What, why? Why doesn't that happen? Why doesn't he use the same 
actors or similar actors or at least a couple here and there in film to film to film why do you think you have this desire to have a fresh new cast cast with every feature um it's I, i've always taken it as a mixture of things mm. uh one is that he's all Dakota loves discovering new talent. Mm. I think that you can read any interview, and he's always been fiercely proud of like discovering yeah, like Josh right. Henderson, who was was he in Glee for a short time? I Josh think Henderson, he was, briefly, yeah. yeah. Um, there's that great story how he uh, he interviewed Brad Pitt for a role in Doctor Alien, <laughs> and that he but he didn't trust his instincts mm, at the time, mm. so he turned him down, and then mm. obviously Brad Pitt goes on to become Brad Pitt. <laughs> But he loves discovering new faces, mm. um, and as well, a large part of it is he, he he won't want to oversaturate the market with the same faces. Right, right. But the other part is, and I believe this is something that he's learned from Corman. Mm. I always get the impression that Dakota is very much of the if you do a good job for me on this film or this film, you won't have to work for me again. Right. And then they go on to become stars. I see. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I, I believe we talked in the podcast that he is very, he's very fatherly towards mm-hmm. all these people who he's nurtured. He keeps a close eye on their careers, and you know he, and a lot of them very freely admit that they wouldn't have a career themselves had it right. not been for being cast by David Dakota. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think it just it's a it's a mixture of wanting to discover new talent all the time, um, and wanting to keep things fresh, mm-hmm. and then you know and just. Above all else, just keeping the cast sexy and young and hip. Definitely. I mean, going back to the CV, mm. you know, 2004 when this came out, it was kind of ringing about the decline of the video store, wasn't it? I'm just mm. trying to think of a reason why. Obviously, something changed with him, didn't it? Mm. You know, he didn't have the avenues where he could keep on doing what he'd been doing for six years. I'm pumping out film after film after film, mm. like Final Scream, Frightening, Wolves of Wall Street, bang, bang, bang. You know, he didn't slow down per se, but I mean, certainly from, from our perspective, we weren't able to, to get a hold of films. Like, I mean, I've only just about got The Sisterhood now, in mm. 2020, I think that's it, imported from Italy, I think you've got the same copy. I watched it for the first time this week. Mm. Uh, and it was interesting. Mm. Yeah, a, a, a sort of a female spin on his in his brotherhood formula. Yeah, I wasn't comfortable with that. I don't think no, he, he doesn't. No. He doesn't do it as well. Which is strange, really, is if you look back at David Coro, he has some incredibly strong female characters in his. Mm. Fa- I know that we the sort of open joke is that he's all about the boys. He's all mm. about the hunks, uh, but. In terms of, look, he's he's the guy who gave us uh, the three squ- the three scream queens, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Quigley, Bauer, yeah. Ring Stevens. He joined them together in Sorority Babes and the Slime Ball Ballerama and Nightmare Sisters, mm. and they are strong characters in there. He gave us Lady Avenger, which is it's a fucking female fronted <laughs> death wish and he kicks ass mm. and he's always always been very keen of saying that he likes strong female characters yeah even the uh the, the erotica that he did for full moon in the 90s under the torchlight label mm. petticoat planet has some fabulously elizabeth kitens character in there she is an absolute Mm. To, uh, a tour de force of their performance well I mean you only need to listen to his commentaries on like uh, he did a great commentary with David Del Val on what, a Curtis Harrington film mm. and he, Curtis Harrington was something who he, someone who he really really admired and you can obviously tell that he does have an eye for, for really strong female mm. characters but I just feel personally that when he tries to do this this teeny group action yeah. I just think boys work better than girls for him yeah yeah, the it, it's a more comfortable fit. Yeah. Well, that's that's not to say that the sisterhood and and even witches of the Caribbean, mm-hmm. the, the, which is the sort of loose, a, yeah. a loose follow up, I would say. Um, that's not to say that they're not sexy. They deliver the sort of PG thirteen sort of erotica. Mm. If such, you know, if, as bizarre as that sounds, it, it's got that sort of teasing. It's they're like the. Uh, it's like the video for all the things she said by Tattoo. Remember that? <laughs> mm-hmm. Back in like yeah. the early noughties. I, th- mm-hmm. I don't think you, I, every single one of my mates were like, the, the lads anyway were obsessed with this <laughs> lesbian teasing video. 
Um, and it's like that sort of thing. Yeah. A little bit coy in that. But I, I just think that he, it fits better with, with the dudes. He has a better handle yeah. on, and I, I, you know, and he knows how to shoot them. Mm. No, but this, this period, though, the followed uh, 2004, I will make my point eventually. <laughs> and the, it just seemed to be thematically, it lost its way. I mean, like we say, we, 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 we've divvied up his career, and you've got that nice, mm. comfortable full moon period. You've got that nice, bookended, rapid heart period. Mm. Then, fast forward 2000, blah, blah, blah. you got that bookend of 13, 13. Yeah, period. yeah. But in between, say, 2004 to 09, maybe, mm. you've got a really up and down sort of you got you got the the creature feature he did for sci-fi grizzly rage yeah. you got the poe films mm. you know the raven and house of russia it's a little bit more scattershot but mm. that's probably just my um sort of ocd mind being well, a little with with those movies grizzly rage notwithstanding mm. a lot of the films in that era from from uh, the sisterhood onwards mm. They were regent movies as well, often mm. done in conjunction with his own rapid heart pictures. Right. Uh, but, you know, post Ring of Darkness, Dakota, he, he had a fruitful collaboration with regent. So you had The Sisterhood, Witches of the Caribbean, Killer Bash, Brotherhood 4, uh, and then The Raven, which opened the door for, a, for the first film in a 10 picture deal mm. with mm. regent. Uh, so that led to two more poor adaptations House of Usher and The Pit and the Pendulum. Uh, Brotherhood Four, and, uh, Brotherhood Five, sorry, and Brotherhood Six, mm. Alien Presence, Stem Cell, uh, the aforementioned uh, pansexual film noir playing with fire, The Invisible Chronicles, and finally in 2010, Body Blow. Mm, mm. Now, in that time frame, what we need to remember is that Region merged. Uh, with Planet Out and Here Networks to form Here Media, mm, yeah. which was uh, an LGBT-oriented media company. So Here Here TV had launched in two thousand and two yeah. uh, as a on-demand and pay-per-view service, and then it became a full twenty-four hour premium network in October two thousand and four. But when they merged to form Here Media in two thousand and nine time. DVD was well and truly past mm. the its boom period. I think right. DVDs big boom was it 2006 maybe something yeah. like that peak I would say yeah Yeah. Uh, now his movies were going to like pay per view um, I believe I'm not 100% sure I'd have to check it out but I, th I think House of Usher actually had a very very limited theatrical release mm -hmm. and a bit of a marketing move for here but yeah like that was when Dakota's movies started entering the world of streaming mm. more so than uh, th this is probably the last of his DVD era, mm, and mm. as you said, certainly the last film that we got in the UK for for several years mm, mm. that he made, uh, which and it, which is crazy when you think how it, this was all over the place in, yeah. in what two thousand and four time. Mm -hmm. Is that when it came out over yeah. here? No, it, it, it was it. It came out before the US DVD, didn't it? it came out on UK DVD. September the 6th, 2004. Right, but yeah, yeah. But US DVD was about six months later. Although I had played the American film market mm -hmm. in February 2004. Um, I know it, it premiered on Showtime mm. as well before it's... Uh, it was released in March 2005 in the United States via First Look, but it had played on Showtime mm. before then. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. But it was released summer 2004 here in the UK via Mosaic. Mm. Mosaic, you say? Mm. Great label. I hate, as you do, this worship of film labels. You know, like they're more important than the films. Mm. Because that's what a lot of people who are into films like us, they do lose sight of what the, the creative bit mm. is. You know, essentially, I mean, we, we've, we've been around enough film labels to know that for the most part, the people running the film labels are only really interested in the money. Mm, yeah. <laughs> They're not interested in anything else. Mm. So to kind of put a film label on a pedestal is very, uh, uh, I don't think it's very healthy. However, I do think the Mosaic films are one of the exceptions. Because mm. I think the person that ran that company, Ian Muspratt, um, I think he, uh, he had a good eye for a film. I mean, 
Muspratt goes way back to 1985. Uh, he ran a video shop uh, and under the Home Entertainment Corporation banner, he set up the Choices rental chain, which was pretty much the main competitor to Blockbuster here in, here in Britain. Um, and it did well. I think he had got a couple of hundred stores, but he, he really had a, a great passion to go into film distribution. Mm. Uh, so he did. And it worked out really, really well. I mean, some of the films that Mosaic put out, uh, that was his label, are absolutely superb. Uh, I mean, you know, you could run through them. You know, stuff like The Night Flyer, mm. for example. Um, stuff that we've covered on our podcast, you know, like They Nest. Um, love object, uh, arachnid. I know you. Well, maybe not. A lot that. of the, yeah, they got all the Fantastic Factory yeah. stuff, didn't they? Yeah, or a lot of it up until about, you know, up until about two thousand and four time. You know, Faust. Mm. Beyond Reanimator mm. with its snazzy green case. Yeah, um, Rama Santa, brilliant black Cadillac, brilliant, brilliant film. They mm. had a great eye for films. Um. But unfortunately, things didn't really pan out. My mosaic were fairly short-lived, uh, mainly due to the fact that um, the rental rights directive came in to force in the UK, which kind of put the whole industry in upheaval. What it meant is that you could buy a film uh, the same day as you could rent it, which was mm -hmm. unheard of. You know, Previously, there's always been a, a six-month window between buying and renting, but now that that was out, that was gone, and it was Warner Brothers that initiated that with Training Day. Now all the other stores, Blockbuster and Global, were horrified. They were horrified by this, uh, and they boycotted Warner. But Mus Pratt bowed, and he was the first guy to sign a deal with Warner Brothers, um, and that really affected him, and it meant. That many many video stores stopped stocking mosaic films, which ultimately in, in like a protest against mm. him basically being seen as a scab as yeah, he crossed I, the picket I remember line. it happening. Wow. Okay. I remember it happening that that the only place I could rent a mosaic film was was, was Choices, mm. and it was a, it was like a 30, 40 minute drive to my nearest Choices um, branch, which was just insane. One thing I wanted to bring up here, just to get away from from like paper pushing and and um, stuff like that is footwear <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know yeah no the sandals because, because this, this, this is i mean you know uh, just because you're having a black mask doesn't mean your feet should be uh no but you know we know that dakota has, has a foot thing dakota has a clear foot thing always you have guys in you know tight white pants and white socks mm. exception being speed demon mm. where it's boots uh boots and boxes uh, but here, yeah, Ring of Darkness is the only film where we have boxes and flip flops. Flip flops. Yeah. Don't think it quite works, <laughs> but you know. Um, I do. Uh, you know this sequence here, the dream sequence. Mm. Look at that. That is classic Dakota. <laughs> the man That's knows show, how to shoot, like almost this gothic sort of lyricism. Um, he is very much a filmmaker influenced by the likes of Jess Franco and Jean Rowling mm. to me, you know, and especially they deal in a similar sort of uh, a, a similar sort of dream, dreamy and oniric manner. Mm -hmm. uh, it also helps that they both have, you know, Rowling, Franco and Dakota all seem to have this fixation on the various... Uh, erotic possibilities of vampires and things like mm. that, uh, but yeah, Dreams and Dakota is a very dreamed, dream driven filmmaker. They are very oniric, mm. and they are often powered by what what we term nightmare logic. Mm. Um, Dakota himself, he often describes his work as a fever dream, mm. particularly things like uh, Sorority Babes in the Slime Ball Ball Arama. Um, and then things like Speed Demon, which is just fabulous and really like crazy, as if as if like Clive Barker had directed Mad Love Max. Love, Love it. But uh, the strange thing about Ring of Darkness is, even though it's got this wonderfully over the top dream sequence, mm. it is probably one of his less dreamy and less surreal offerings. It's much uh, 
pardon the pun, straighter than <laughs> uh, a lot of his other movies in terms of it doesn't sort of require you to fill the plot in by dream-driven information or mm. visuals. They were some of the most homoerotic visuals in the film just then, weren't they? Yes, yes. Each individual band member just complete, you know. Mm. Scan top to bottom. She looks great in red, doesn't she? That oh, red really the, pops the, off the screen. The femme fatale aspect mm, to mm, her is just lipstick. great as well. And I do like the sort of swerve where it's later revealed that Alex isn't the voodoo priestess in charge. <laughs> She's just like a servant of the yeah, band. I think that's yeah. great. Um, a little bit confusing, though, because it is very much painted like Alex is the one running the show mm, the entire mm, time. Yeah. Uh, and it seems a bit counterproductive that they get rid of one manager who can practice black magic and they get rid of him, but then they get someone else, they get her to take over. Yeah. So it's like, so you've trained up your own manager in the dark arts, you know, but, but whatever, it's all cool. Um, some of the uh, cave stuff in here that we've just been witnessing, I'm not sure where the beach things were filmed. I it's want at, to um... say... El Matador State Beach. All oh, right, okay, okay. Yeah. I was trying to work out whether he, the, it was filmed in similar sort of areas to where they shot portions of Beach Babes from beyond oh, right. as well. Uh, do, you know, I haven't gone as far to compare the rock formations or anything like I, that. I did but, though. Uh, I, I did, did though, check the um, the distance. Do you know how far it is from um, from Bronson State Case to El Matador Beach? How far? It's twenty miles. Okay. No, twenty okay. minutes. Yeah, cause, uh, cause, because, of course, all the the stuff with the black mass that we've seen, and that, that was all shot in Bronson Caves, which is a, uh, a location made famous by everyone from John Ford to Roger Corman and Fred Olden Ray. Mm. So, often used. Um, I do think... Have you got anything more that you want to say on Mosaic and stuff before we move on to something else? Or? Not Mosaic, of course, we need to get into a DJ at some point but we can oh, do that completely, shortly completely um, I think before we do that though we do need to say that if you are familiar with David Dakota you probably are more than aware of Rapid Heart Pictures his mm. boutique uh, outfit and production company they're very much the they're the the Rapid Heart movies are very much the films that you think of when you say David Dakota. Yeah, you know they're the good, ones, they're good, the yeah. tighty whitey mm-hmm. shockers and things like that. They're yeah. the homoerotic shockers. Um, now here's the thing: Ring of Darkness is not a Rapid Heart movie. Mm-hmm. However, it might as well be because it has that mix of boys, boxer shorts, B movie frills, uh, but. Again, that's because the Rapid Heart style is at this point in time when it was made. That was Dakota's style. Yeah. You know, just as now he's grinding out the Lifetime movies, the mm. wrong roommate, the wrong sitter, the wrong whatever. That's his style now. Mm. Back in the time where Ring of Darkness was made, two thousand and three, two thousand and four time, Rapid Heart was the style that Dakota was becoming known for. Uh, and again, it's it. It's as we said earlier that that nineteen ninety seven from that that stretch after that that's what Dakota is really about as a filmmaker. I think all in all between ninety seven and twenty twelve that's the homoerotic stuff. That's what we'd now recognise as the Dakota style as as Dakotaian. Uh, and again, be, be that done via for higher work at Full Moon, uh, John Ayres' CGM region or his own Rapid Heart. Um, and yeah, you nailed it, man. You said that that is this is his most interesting era because this is him reconciling his own sensibility as an artist with mm. the demands of the market. Yeah, I mean, I know we said at the beginning that this is the ideal place to dive in. Mm. Oh, it's a great introduction to Dakota, but I think if you sort of if you're going to try and get him, then start. In this period, start between ninety seven and two thousand and four. Mm. You know, absorb this, and then you can go both sides, go both yeah. ways, so to yeah. speak. I mean, because Rapid Heart as as a label and the Rapid Heart style, mm. it is what he's about. That's his passion. Yeah, you can tell from interviews that he conducted at the time. You can, 
you know, you, you can tell from how he spoke about Rapid Heart and what mm. his plans for it were, were as a label. I think it has simmered down somewhat. It still exists, but I don't yeah. think... I think he's that entrenched in my lifetime stuff, but he hasn't made a Rapid Heart movie for a couple of years no, now. No, like Bloody, Bloody Blacksmith and stuff like that. Yeah. Were like the last few, weren't they? Mm. Which is still worth checking out. I think you can watch them... If, if, you, if they're not on Prime, you can see them via his website. Via yeah, rapidheart.tv. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, no, just, I'm just quickly going to say then that... Um, you do get the reason to say that if you want to try and get the whole Dakota phenomenon, that you should begin here because I, I do find that a lot of people, maybe older people, began Dakota with Creepazoids, mm. Sorority Babes, Nightmare Sisters, Murder Weapon, and then they see this and they think, oh, yeah, <laughs> they get scared. Where I think, whereas because we're maybe a little bit younger. I think mm. because we began here, mm. I think it's helped us understand the whole yeah. thing. But it's so strange, whereas you watch a scene like this, this is literally a play-for-play -play copy of the scene in Nightmare Sisters, mm. where mm. you've got Quigley, Bower and Stevens ravishing a shirtless hook. <laughs> you know, but just because they're, it's nude women doing the nibbling and the ravishing. Mm. But I don't know. I, uh, it, it frustrates me no end that I'll... Uh, a sizable chunk of people who label things like Creepazoids as, as works of brilliance and that. Mm. And as good as it, I love Creepazoids, I mm. love it, love it to death, but as good as that movie is, this is infinitely more interesting and infinitely better from a technical level, purely because he'd had so much experience up to that point. Yeah. And it's just bizarre that people can discount it just because of you know a bit of homoeroticism. Because mm. ultimately, that's what it is. That's mm. why people do recoil in horror at the mention of Dakota. Yeah. Quick shout out for Jeff Farley and Chris Bergschneider, who of course did the the uh, makeup effects on this. Mm hmm. Long time collaborators, mm. Dakota. Uh, just before this, I believe they supplied the the eponymous leeches <laughs> in leeches. Uh, they've done a few other bits and bobs over the years. I think one of their most notable achievements for me is in Prison of the Dead, where mm. they design those great sort yeah. of like those zombies that looks like something straight from Tombs of the Blind Dead. I think yeah. they're just fucking excellent. I mm. love them. Uh, and yeah, they're just really skilled rubber and latex slingers who mm. can really put something together in, in a matter of hours yeah. for chump change. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about ceremony. Why does ceremony play such a big part in Dakota's films? Because that's the one mm. factor that straddles pretty much every one of them. There's mm. a ceremony in almost all of these. Do you think he's using that as a, as a plot device, as a reason to get boys in their boxes? Do you think it's... I don't know. I mean... it why the compulsion mm. for a ceremonial scene and an initi initi initiation of some point why why does that feature so strongly in his key films well in terms of what you say in the more meat and potatoes stroke exploitation side of it it is a great way to get the boobs out mm. for girls to get the chests and the asses out for the lads. Mm. You know, it, it, it's a good way to get the obligatory ticket A on show. Mm. However, on an artistic level, there is a certain sense with a lot of Dakota's movies, they do tend to deal with the idea of s someone or a small group of people fighting a force mm. infinitely bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the ritual side of it, I'm um, I'm not entirely sure how that factors into it, but there's a certain sense of it being in relation to the loss of control um, and in relation to to it sort of being... I can't think how to explain it. Just it it's oh, To me, it's the abstract nature of the images are worth explaining them. Mm. That in, and it's a way to clue you in that these films, though they might have some semblance of real world footing, mm. that it is about 
spirituality, that it's about magic, it's about blurring the lines between fantasy and reality and dreams mm. and, uh, you know, and being awake. And I think that that all factors in there. It just, it, it emphasises this this schism between what is real and what is not. Mm. And that's how I've always interpreted it anyway. On screen, obviously, they've got the big reveal uh, just playing out there as... Uh, as Pearl Sean realises that uh, the band has been reincarnated several times from a number of different boy bands. And the pictures that he was going through there, it, it's funny, you know, they're actually made up of real people um, and really interesting people. For example, uh, the 80s, uh, the 50s boy band member, one of them was, was a guy called James Townsend, mm. who's, a, who's a huge uh, gay genre icon. He wrote and, and starred in the uh, the excellent film um, Sideline Secrets, uh, which was out a couple of, about two decades ago. Yeah. And also one of the 80s band members in, in one of the pictures there was a guy called uh, Michael Habush, who um, has been in the odd triple um, X film, shall we say, <laughs> most notable of which is uh, The Cockpit Club. <laughs> <laughs> well, not to be confused with our website <laughs> The Schlock Pit no this is The Cock Pit <laughs> what do you think the significance is of ritual in a Dakota film I don't know um, he really likes it and he shoots mm. it well it's certainly one of the most visually appealing bits of any of his mm. films um, I do think that's a large part of the visual side I, th- of I think it. I, don't, I don't think there's anything um, deeper than that Really, um, I think Dakota himself would be hard pushed to explain it. I think he I think sees he'd be it more loath as to a, explain it. <laughs> yeah, I think he sees it more as a as a plot device. But he is very he is big on sensuality, and he does mm. like you know he 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 does like those sort of satanic shockers and things like that. And he does and he hates explicit uh, mm. stuff, doesn't he? I think. Yeah. Did you ask about that once? I can't remember because I, I know you were quite shocked, didn't you? See. Um, can you see a, a, a willy in one of the 13... Not the yeah, one. I've been... Um, I, my, it was one of my ongoing quests as, <laughs> as as what I hope to be one of the preeminent <laughs> David Dakota scholars someday mm. is uh, is to document all the full frontal male nudity in there because he's very coy. Very coy, that, that, yeah. that, though, that links um, with something... I, I had the pleasure of talking to him a couple of years ago about it and he said that he likes to keep the sexuality in his films exportable. Mm, you mm. know, very clean, very coy, sensuality. Mm. You can hint at it. And, and particularly round about this time, I mean, it's only in the last few years that, that queer cinema has had such a boom. Mm. Before it was all done, you know, it was almost done behind closed doors mm, before. Yeah. It was very chaste as well. It was very, like, the stuff that would enter into popular culture, it was always done via innuendo. Or yeah. it was always done through, like, you know, just a wink and a nudge. Mm-hmm. Where the example he gave me was about the Brotherhood. Mm. You know, where he could get that into Blockbuster, even though it's this screamingly queer vampire movie. But if anyone brought it back to complain, presumably, as I've jokingly referred to, it was about the Darren's, Johns, and Robs of the world who'd be <laughs> sitting down wanting to watch a, a trashy horror movie with their girlfriends, only to be horrified as she's like gawping at these beautiful chiseled six packs, and he and they're just inundated with all these <laughs> visible penis lines in these tight white boxer shorts mm, mm. and you know they, it, that whole I'm not gay I'm not gay sort of <laughs> screaming as they watch this procession of homoerotica but he said that he would get those films into blockbuster and if mm. anyone came back complaining like hey hang about buddy this movie's so gay he'd be like oh whoa, they're just beautiful male vampires there's nothing <laughs> gay about this and it was just a clever way to yeah, get yeah. that across in there um but yeah, and, and I think that he, he is big on sensuality mm, and stuff. Mm. And I think that's infinitely more interesting than as if he was, you know, just waving full on nakedness in front of the screen. You know, no, if you look I, at something like Naked Instinct from 1993, right, that's probably yeah. one of his most least interesting movies yeah. because it is just... I mean, it, it's very, very good as a piece of softcore mm, titillation. Mm. Do not get me wrong, it's insanely sexy. And Michelle Bauer, has, she looks stunning mm. in it. But at the same time, that is all it is. It is softcore erotica, mm. you know. Whereas this, the rapid heart era stuff, there's a plot to a lot of it, and it's teased. And rather than just nudity for the sake of nudity, there is 
the sexual tension to mm. scenes and stuff like that. Like I always think for Brotherhood, you don't know whether the guys are going to bite each other's necks or start fucking each other. You know, <laughs> and and that that electricity, you can feel it. You can feel it in in the Wolves of Wall Street, mm. where you know you, mm. you you can feel the sexual tension between the characters. You can feel the sexual tension here in Ring of Darkness. I think, yeah. whereas you can take the you know, them trying to get Sean to join the band is as much them. They might as well be trying to get him to partake in an orgy. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's that another fun sort of double-ended joke to it. It's like the whole Top Gun beach volleyball scene. Mm. You know, where it, if if you know, you know. <laughs> you know, if if you know that what they're trying to get at, and in the interview I had with Dakota, he he said that sometimes with. With homoerotica, sometimes you, it can be very, very subtle and it'll go mm. right over people's heads, but mm. sometimes mm. people will watch it like, hang about, I, what <laughs> what the fuck's going on with this? Mm. And mm. I, I love that. And uh, yeah, so there, there is full frontal nudity mm. in, a, in a few Dakota movies, male nudity, sorry, um, particularly Leather Jacket Love Story, mm. but that's about the sort of, it's about casual hookups and mm. stuff like that. And it's, it's a film of like, wanton gay abandon you know, mm. a romantic view of uh, you know gay promiscuity and then uh, I can't I think it's free scream yeah, queens is, yeah, is yeah. where, where you, uh, you've got a full frontal male shower scene but, uh, but I mean above all else you couldn't have this in Ring of Darkness because this film over here in the UK is a 12 certificate that's the weird thing isn't it it's certified mm. 12 the trader is certified 15 and yet on Amazon it's rated 18 plus mm. which is Bizarre. 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 Um, Matteo Londono uh, was the director of photography. Mm -hmm. on this. It was his only film with Dakota. Which is very unusual, mm. really, because if one thing, he might not use the same cast over and over again, uh, particularly from this era anyway. Mm. Uh, but he tended to, you know, you had uh, Howard Wexler mm. shooting a lot of movies, Tom Calloway, mm. um, I forget the guy, the, the Romanian guy who shot a lot of his mm -hmm. stuff uh, when he was over in Romania. He would use a lot of the same technicians. Yeah. Funny enough that um, Londono has just finished um, shooting the new Paul Schrader film. The Jesuit. Oh really? Yeah. So he's, oh wow. Uh, maybe he's just maybe he just priced him out. Maybe. So. How do you feel about like how people perceive Dakota's stuff? Is it is it you know we, every time we post something on Instagram linking to an article that we've done I always get a certain sense that there is a pocket of our followers that yeah. are like ooh gay I just to be honest we, we like it sounds boastful it sounds arrogant we like films that not many people pay attention to mm. it's not trying to be different we're not doing this to try and sort of um, stick two things up to mainstream film critics uh we do this because we genuinely like and have a passion for the things we watch. And to be honest, if, if I write a piece on a Gary Graver movie and, and it's been universally slagged off, or I write something, um, I don't know, a J.S. Cardoni film that not many people like. like mm. I wrote a bit about The Mummy and the Armadillo um, a couple of months back. and. I love that, that by the way sorry to interrupt just when mm. they're putting their faces back on I love that <laughs> yeah, and they're just hanging there flopping off their chin I think that's fabulous um, and nobody likes Mummy and the Armadillo and I don't care most of the films I write about that nobody likes I really don't care but Dakota films that's one thing that bothers me I, mm. I don't it upsets me that people mm. don't like his films and it upsets me that when you speak to someone about Dakota films, we, we, we've, we've befriended people in the past and you get talking about um, who you like. And the second you say Dakota, you feel them sniggering on the other mm. side of the computer screen. Um, and, you know, and they say, oh, well, OK, I'll, I'll give one a chance. So you stick a Dakota film on and then it's it's just it, it's such a they need to make a. You should have stopped at Puppet Master 3. <laughs> well, no, but no. 
they, they, they always try and make a big drama out of mm. it like it's a big deal it's a film it's a fucking yeah. film <laughs> stop trying to people are way too concerned with how they're viewed I think on mm. social media and I don't think it's particularly cool to like David Dakota so I think that's why most people don't say it. and those people that do say like David Dakota do it tongue in cheek yeah ironically um, ironically that, that really pisses me off mm. I would rather someone just be up front and say they don't like something rather than snigger at it yeah. sure there is I def- you know, there is stuff in his CV that is risible Mm. Okay, but then if you've made like 150 odd <laughs> movies, I'm sure you can't be brilliant without making the occasional doo doo. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that is a that is a quote I gleaned from Daniel Matmore, oh. who, who used yeah. that to describe Toby Hooper when I spoke to him a couple of years ago. Bang! Oh, did you hear that name drop? <laughs> uh, but yeah, like there is stuff that's risible in Dakota's mm. CV, uh, but. Not all of it. There's some absolute brilliance, and mm. the brilliance far outweighs the bad. Some of it is average in between, but there is there is a distinctive personality mm. to his movies. But I do find it strange that for there is also a certain breed of when it comes to queer audiences mm. who think that he doesn't go far enough and stuff. Yeah. Where you have to realise that these films were made post Scream for a for the teen market mm. these you know these were made for 13 to 14 year old girls and 13 to 14 year old boys who were just realising what they are they're not meant to be explicit gay porno mm-hmm. you know it's the same sort of to me it's like something maybe like Maxim or Loaded used to be like those sort of lads mags where it was you know, they, they weren't designed to be something like Mayfair or like, <laughs> you know, whatever it is people listen, people used to read by then. Razzle, for example. <laughs> but they, it was done as a way for the girls and boys figuring out who they were mm, and mm. stuff. And I think that in that sense, if you think of these as made for the PG-13 mm. demographic, these films do achieve a lot. And I can't, I can't begin to imagine how many young lads that they probably helped come to terms with who they were as well yeah I completely agree I mean you know if I die and I never get to convince anyone to realise that Ginger Dead Man 2 is a masterpiece or that mm. Danny Draven is a really great director Danny Draven's a fucking phenomenal director um, he edited this as well didn't he he did and, and his he, wife did yeah, it, yeah. yeah. Um, and if people if I never get to do that then that's fine. I can take that. I can mm. take having those, you know, obsessions to myself. But if I if I died and I didn't get to spread a little Dakota among people and get them to realise, mm. you know, to see beyond the bullshit that he's a really good director and he makes amazing films, then mm. I think that would genuinely upset me. Yeah. Um, but I just think it's unfortunate. I just think, and he doesn't. He doesn't care. He does. He doesn't want adulation. No. He doesn't want you know a uh, a two thousand word op ed in some you know film, you know whatever the sight and sound or whatever, mm. saying hmm, well actually everyone should go back to yeah. He doesn't want that. But I just feel that people should maybe chuck away this this facade of bravado and maybe uh, you know look at look at these films again. And reevaluate them because it, it's so sad that that people are stuck in some kind of, um, uh, especially men. It's mainly men mm. who are stuck in this this this, um, you know, terrified of uh, yeah. of, of watching someone. I mean, I think if you're terrified watching just good-looking lads in their underwear, that speaks more to your insecurities than anyone else's, mm, I think. Mm. I mean, I can say, I, I can sit here quite perfectly comfortable watching this movie and, you know, it, it, you know sexuality is completely irrelevant. Mm. Just surrender yourself to the story, surrender yourself to the visuals. Mm. You know, and above all else, for years, for years, that's another, do you see that little flash of a necklace there? Yeah. That's something else of this period that Dakota seemed big on some sort of trinket. Mm. Uh, if you look at something like Talisman, oh, their yeah, okay. speed yeah. demon, mm-hmm. I think what that is, I think it relates back to his absolute love of Charles Band's crash. 
and oh, I think course. that's what that's yeah, inspired yeah. that's a little nod that's to that's a great commentary mm. if anyone uh, subscribed to Full Moon uh, streaming you must if it's still there listen to David Dakota's commentary with Charlie on Crash it, it's absolutely wonderful and it just it makes you fall in love with Dakota I think the more this is what, maybe this is this is the this is the this is the the plan for getting into Dakota. You should listen to his commentaries on other people's films. Mm. You tend to appreciate him even more, especially his 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 knowledge about the film business. Yeah, and his the amount of films he's seen, and the people he's met and the people he's known. Ah, uh, it's just yeah, it really he really. He's a film do. fan through yeah, and through, and absolutely. maybe maybe that's the point. We can sit here and we can put point out little trademarks and stuff and we can point out we can question the use of ritual but mm. maybe the answer is so simple as he saw it in a hammer movie once and thought it'd look fucking cool mm. let's mention dej quickly because mm-hmm. they of course put it out today in america yes dej were a fascinating label they were they fell under the blockbuster umbrella the dej stands for dean and dean wilson e for ed and it's dead and j is j uh, john antioco who, of course, was CEO of Blockbuster when I was there. <laughs> um, you, you worked in Blockbuster? I did. Uh, you never told me that before. <laughs> um, and so it, this was Blockbuster's little film company, although it was run primarily by Ed Stead, mm. who, um, sorry, Dean Wilson, who sadly died uh, at age only 52 in 2010. Um, but DJ did well. If I had to sum up what DEJ were, they were kind of the physical media Netflix. Mm. They kind of bought up everything that nobody wanted and tried to make money out of it. And they did well. They picked up some really cool films. I mean, there's a great article. If you want to, I won't waffle on too much because I know we're running out of time. Um, but if you want to read a really good piece on DEJ, then head over to the Dallas Observer and look at an article entitled uh, Small Screen Big Step by Robert Wolanowski. Um, it, it's a really shitty piece of writing because he does say that um, you know DEJ's roster is littered with titles not even the deaf and blind could stomach <laughs> such as Operation Delta Force 5 yeah whatever um, but yeah but DEJ were literally all about buying films directly from studios looking to dump product that they couldn't squeeze into multiplexes um, and they also had deals with Showtime mm which is why, of course, they picked up Ring of Darkness for release. But it's really interesting that just, just prior to this, that there's, there's an article in, in, this art, in, this, in this essay that says um, how DEJ was beginning to flex a mighty muscle. This week it expects to sign a deal with a major studio to release a $50 million production, which the studio wants to dump before it spends one more penny on promotion and distribution. And distribution. Wilson won't discuss it, until contracts are signed sometime this week. Do you know what film that is? What? <laughs> well, it must have been. Uh, Detox. Ah, the yeah. Stallone flick. Yeah. Okay. Um, DJ, um, they were actually completely taken over by First Look. For a good price. Yeah, in 2005. Uh, First Look bought them from Blockbuster for a cool $25 million. Mm. Uh, How yeah, many films? Oh, was it? It's, There's so many different. Was it one like, article said two two five, one mm, said three hundred, one said five hundred. But it's a lot of films. Yeah, hell, a few hundred, mm. a few hundred. Uh, but yeah, they so DJ had also released uh, Dakota's first three Brotherhood films: Final Stab, The Frightening, and of course Wolves of Wall Street. Prior to picking this up, so long story short, that's why Dakota's rapid heart slash rapid heart era films of a new millennium that's why they were so prevalent in blockbusters uh, the US over during the first few years of the new millennium because the company releasing them on video and DVD were were owned by the rental giant Mm -hmm. which is just extraordinary and wow that's that's it this is our ring of darkness commentary done and dusted man that's insane there's loads I haven't I haven't mentioned so a quick belated mention for um, for Sean's eyebrows, which <laughs> which which are moulded within an inch of their life, and credit to him. Also, we didn't mention uh, Jake's uh, black fingernails, which I thought was a very sort of uh, very mm, nice, a nice touch. gender bending touch oh, there towards the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's about it. 
I hope that we've kept you entertained. Uh, more than anything, though, I hope that we've maybe increased your enjoyment of Ring of Darkness just that little bit more. And more than anything on top of that, I hope we've inspired you to maybe seek out a little bit more work from uh, David Decoto. But you need to keep in touch. You need to tell us how you did with this. You need to mm. tell us what you thought. Yeah. Um, you know, tell us we're wrong. We don't care. We won't listen to you. But we'll, we'll keep we'll keep ruffling. By the way, we've got yeah. about twenty minutes of credit. Um, <laughs> but you know, please tell us we're wrong. Tell us we're idiots. Tell us we don't know what we're talking about. Because you know, we're, we're not precious, and we do like debate. So if you yeah, like, we just want to talk movies. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed um, watching this. It's great to catch up with it. Mm. It's great to catch up with it. Mm. Um, well, that's it from us. So thanks very much for your time. I have been Matty Budrevich. And I have been Dave Wayne. And look out in the end credits for the caterer. Ah, Carolyn Purdy Gordon. Yes. The wife of Stuart Gordon. Mm. I told you, everything's linked. Everything.